Hello and welcome back. In the last video, we learned how to prepare grain for spawn with popcorn. In this video, we'll cover inoculating the grain. We're going to do some more transfers to freshen up some cultures that I thought looked off. And next, we'll talk about grain colonization, breaking and shaking grain to speed up colonization, and we'll talk about contamination in spawn and what to look out for. This should be everything you need to know to get from inoculating grain to getting ready to spawn to bulk. Let's not waste any more time and get right into it. Let's begin with the transfers. These cultures colonize the entire plate and they look sort of off, so I made new plates. These cultures are both Thai elephant dung crossed with true albino melman. I'm including these transfers in the series because I want to show everything that I'm doing. So just consider this a little refresher. To start off, you need to do this procedure in an aseptic environment. You'll need a scalpel, a torch to sterilize the scalpel, a culture you would like to subculture, a new clean plate to put the transfers on, and something to wrap the plates with. I'll be using grafting tape. I'm going to take transfers from close to the edge of the plate, but I'm not going to use the leading edge because it's reached the edge of the plate. When you take transfers, try to get as small a piece of mycelium as you can. Make sure the blade of the scalpel only touches the mycelium you're trying to subculture in the agar. Both of these cultures are completely tomentose mycelium. It might be hard to see, but there are two separate cultures on each plate. The older plates look sort of weird, but that's because the mycelium is eating the food coloring up. Most colored plates will turn white or beige over time. It's nothing to worry about. Here I can show you a perfect example of bad technique. Notice how my fingertips are going over the edge of the plate. This can be a problem and a source for contamination. It might not seem like much, but this could potentially ruin the whole plate, depending on what falls off your fingertips. While doing lab work, you need to always be mindful of where your hands are and what they're doing. I've said it before, but in the beginning, recording your lab sessions and watching them afterwards can drastically improve your technique. There is a lot you can miss in the heat of the moment, but the camera sees everything. Real quick, I want to give a shout out to Big Mush 9000. He makes content about mushrooms and gives great advice. He's close to getting monetized, so if you haven't heard of him, check out his channel and show some love. He has been very supportive of me and my channel, so if you're looking for more content, swing by his channel. I'll link it in the description. Thanks. Now let's get to these inoculations. I'll be using bags instead of jars for spawn. I switched to bags from jars because bags are easier to break and shake and less dangerous because the bags won't break and cut you when you break and shake the grain. I like to get them unwrapped and ready before I start messing with the mycelium. I bring my PC with the bags in it to my FFU. I open it and move the bags in the airflow so I don't have to clean them. If you move bags or jars through open air to your workstation, they need to be sanitized. You will need a scalpel, a torch, a stapler, and something to wrap your plates with. I'm using grafting tape. You'll need a culture you would like to perform an inoculation with, and you'll need to do this in an aseptic environment. I'm using an FFU. When everything is cleaned and ready to go, hand sanitized, we can begin. We'll start by flame sterilizing the scalpel. Once the scalpel cools off, we can begin. While still holding the scalpel, open the plate with both hands. Use the hand not holding the scalpel to hold the lid. We're gonna select some clean mycelium to inoculate the popcorn with. You really don't need a lot of mycelium to perform an inoculation. I try to get mycelium that's closest to the edge of the culture. Try to avoid the old transfer pieces. Try to avoid touching any part of the plate with the scalpel. Make sure the pieces you cut out are easy to pick up and make sure it's cut all the way around so the agar is easier to remove. Once we made our selection, you can put the plate down and open the bag with your free hand. Make sure not to touch anything with the scalpel. Make sure it doesn't move out of the airflow or out of the still air box or touch the sides of the still air box. If the mycelium falls off, do not try to pick it up and use it. You have to get a new transfer. Once the bag is open, we want to drop the mycelium into the bag. Try not to let the agar get stuck to the side of the bag. 
If it does, you can gently flick the bag to get it to fall. If you're doing this in a still air box, you want to perform this procedure as quickly as possible and reduce the amount of time the bag is open as much as possible. Once the mycelium is in the bag, I fold the top of the bag over two to three inches. Then I fold that part in half and then I fold it once more. I do this to make sure there is as little air exchange as possible. There is enough oxygen in the bag to last through the colonization process as long as you don't use too much grain. This is why I only use three quarters of a quart of grain per bag. Now we can staple the bag shut. I usually use three staples. I put two closest to the edge of the bag and then one staple in the center. It's likely not airtight, but it should be pretty close. We don't want fresh air exchange in this situation. If you have a sealer for bags, you could do that instead of stapling them shut. If you're using bags with filters, it will be fine as well. Some air exchange won't hurt anything, we just don't want it in bags without a filter. Once the bag is stapled shut, we can label the bag so we know what we're growing. Once the bag is closed and labeled, I usually squash the agar pieces into the grain so it's not just sitting on top of the grain. You can just leave it on top of the grain and it will still colonize it. It just seems better if I get it into the grain versus just letting it sit on top of the grain. Next, we'll use the other culture from the same plate to perform another inoculation. This is a separate isolation. I'm pretty happy with how these cultures turned out. The mycelium looks great. It's all growing in the same direction, away from the inoculation point. I was sort of worried about these cultures being too close together, but it doesn't seem like it crossed over. They won't breed with each other because they're both already dicarions, but we don't want extra cultures competing for resources. I could have took a transfer from the opposite side, but it's too close to the edge of the plate. When you're getting the mycelium out, if you give it a little lift on each side before you remove it, it will usually make it easier to remove. Sometimes the edges might look cut, but they aren't. This can cause you to drop or flip the mycelium over. Now we just have to get it in the bag. Make sure to be patient while opening the bag. You don't want to move around too much or you might drop the subcultures. Just like the last one, try not to get the agar stuck to the side of the bag. Once the bag is stapled shut, we just have to label it and we can move on to the next inoculation. Now let's do the KSS inoculation. Once our scalpel is flame sterilized and cooled off, we can begin. I lost some of the footage of these procedures. I tried to get two angles, but I deleted one by accident, so I apologize for that. As always, you want to make sure the scalpel only touches the mycelium and the agar. <clears throat> we want to make sure our fingers aren't going over the plate. Try to avoid putting the lid down. If you have to put the lid down, try to face the inside up. If you let the rim sit on anything, it could get contaminants on it and you could likely scrape it off into the dish when you put the lid back on. If you're in a still air box, you need to do this as quickly as possible and open the lid to the plate as little as possible. If you're nervous about doing these procedures, you can practice with just plain agar, doing transfers and etc. until you're more comfortable. With long scalpels like I'm using, it can take some time to get used to balancing agar on the blade. Once we get the subculture in the bag, we can close the bag and staple it shut. And then we can label the bag and we're done. Then we can move on to our next section, which is grain colonization. Now let's talk about grain colonization. Once you add mycelium to the spawn, it will usually take one to three days for it to start growing on the grain. The mycelium will usually get fuzzy at first and then start colonizing the grain. It takes about 10 days to two weeks, possibly a few days longer, for it to completely colonize the grain. It shouldn't take much longer than that though. If it takes longer, then it could be a sign of contamination. It could also be a problem with air or oxygen in the container. The mycelium needs some oxygen to grow and colonize. So if it runs out or it gets low, it can cause it to stall or stop growing. The only other thing I can think of is if the grain is too dry from not being hydrated properly, 
that could stop mycelium from colonizing. I don't try to save spawn or reuse it, so I don't really have a remedy to fix these problems. I don't deal with failure pretty much at all at any stage. I'll usually just throw it away and then redo whatever it was. You should go over everything you did to get to this point. Make sure your grain is hydrated properly. Make sure you aren't using too much grain in your container. And make sure you're sterilizing your grain and agar properly. With bags or jars, try not to move the bags or jars too much because it can disturb the mycelium trying to colonize the grain and set everything back a day or two. We want to let it get established. The mycelium can be tomentose or rhizomorphic, even both at the same time, but it should be similar to how it looked on agar. Once it gets to about 30% fully colonized, we can do a break and shake. Breaking and shaking will help speed up the colonization process because it will go from a big mass of mycelium to a lot of small pieces of mycelium. This creates more inoculation points, which will allow mycelium to colonize more grain. You don't have to do a break and shake, but it will usually speed up the process by a few days. Once the grain looks like it's fully colonized, it's a good idea to do another break and shake. A lot of the time it will look fully colonized, but there could be uncolonized grain that we can't see. Even though the outside is covered in mycelium, there could be some inside that aren't. Spawning grain that isn't fully colonized is an imitation for contamination. You do not want to expose uncolonized grain to the open air. Remember that ambient air is loaded with contaminants. Once grain is colonized, it basically has a shield of mycelium around it that makes it difficult for contaminants to get started on it. Another reason we do break and shakes at 100% is to see if there is any contamination. When you break and shake healthy mycelium, it should completely recover in two to three days. If it doesn't, that could be a sign that there is contamination in the spawn. It's possible for anything to get in there, so it could be bacteria or fungus. Bacteria can be hard to detect just by looking at it. One thing to look out for is grains that won't colonize or completely colonize. There might be part of each grain that the mycelium won't grow on, no matter how many times you break and shake it. This is a sign that there is likely bacterial contamination on the grain. Things to look out for are slime or goo. When there's bacterial contamination, it will usually make the grain smell sour or rotten, but not always. Sometimes it can have a very neutral smell. It should smell like mycelium and grain and nothing else. Make sure not to open your bags or jars for any reason until it's fully colonized. With fungal contamination, it will stop good mycelium from colonizing the grain as well. Most fungal contaminants will change color when it sporulates. So anything that's green, red, pink, brown, or any color except for white, with one exception. When you break and shake grain, you damage the mycelium. So it can turn blue or even slightly green, but it should go away over the course of a couple days. If you do get contamination, it's pretty much the end of the road. You'll have to start over and make spawn again. I do not recommend spawning contaminated grains. With bacterial contamination, it's possible for it to still get some fruits, but a lot less likely. If the grain is contaminated with bacteria, it will make it easier for other contaminants to get started on the grain. The bacteria can weaken the mycelium and even kill it, which will create food sources for fungal contaminants to get started. Once it's fully colonized and you've done the break and shake test, if it recovers, then it's ready to spawn to bolt. And that's it for this video. In the next video, we'll cover making substrate with cocoa and vermiculite, and we'll go over how to spawn to bolt. Thanks for watching. We're getting closer to the end, so thanks to everyone for following along. I'm excited to get all this grain spawned and get some mushrooms growing. If you have any questions about anything or if you have something you would like to add, feel free to leave it in the comments below. Hopefully I'll see you in the next one.